Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to Grand Rounds today. Uh, please remember to uh, sign the tennis record to back the auditorium. And uh, please remember to fill out the tennis record. The attendance evaluation or the program evaluation you get at the back of the auditorium also. Uh, if you could give us any ideas in the direction of the topics and future speakers, see if you can make those always appreciated with uh, those suggestions. Uh, today, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce Dr. William Field. Uh, Dr. Field attended to his undergraduate education at the University of Pennsylvania and then received his PhD at the University of Iowa, uh, where he is uh, currently a professor in the Department of Occupational and Environmental Health and Department of Epidemiology in the College of Public Health. Uh, he has a secondary appointment in the Department of Toxicology and Bioinformatics within the uh, Graduate College at the University of Iowa. He has uh, researched and uh, written extensively on the, the subject of uh, radon and its uh, medical effects, and we're quite pleased that he was able to join us today to update us on uh, radon. Uh, please join me and welcome Dr. Thank you. <laughs> so can everyone hear me okay? Sounds pretty good? All right. Before we get started, I'd like to first ask, how many people here have tested their home for radon? Okay, so there's work to be done here today. I, I can see that. Um, before we start with the presentation, I'd like to just show a short video. We may not show, show the whole thing, but it's a video we produced for healthcare providers about two years ago that was funded by the Iowa Cancer uh, Consortium. So if we could just show that little video to get started, then I'll go into the presentation. Do you know how to My dad is Richard Williams. He's a um, very prominent urologist. He was a very smart man. He was very well educated. He was top of his field. And still radon came in and, and took him away from us. He worked so hard his whole life as a physician to be with his patients. And he was just getting to the part where he could relax and be with his family. And it's that. Mom and I were looking through all the, the lung cancer causes and trying to understand why my dad would get lung cancer. And we saw radon, and I think that that moment, we kind of went, well, what's radon? And tried to figure out more about that. And that's when we discovered that there was a very inexpensive, easy test we could purchase to find out more about the levels in our home. We went to the local hardware store and picked up a home radon kit and put it in the basement to get the results, that was when we found out that we had very high levels in my parents' home. It was registering at about 18. So we knew we were in a danger zone and the email was very clear that we needed to have some more testing done. So we contacted um, a, a radon professional in the Iowa area and had them come and they placed machines around the house for I think it was about five days. And when those levels came back, the basement was a 16, the main floor was an 8, and my parents' bedroom upstairs was 9 and a half. This house is 25 years old. It is very well maintained. My parents have put time and money into making sure it's the best that it can be for them to enjoy it. And there's no reason that this house should have it any more than any others. I think when you think there's something wrong with your house, you think it's an old decaying, yucky basement. Well, their basement isn't an old, decaying, yucky basement. It's well maintained. If your house is beautiful, if your house is not beautiful, there's nothing that radon knows. It is just a gas from the ground, and it can be anywhere. It just needed a simple venting procedure to get the radon out. When we first started talking to family members, everybody said, oh, yeah, yeah, I have that monitor in my house. And and immediately we knew they were talking about a CO monitor and that they, they didn't know what radon was. And, we even thought the same thing at first, so we've taken care of that. But I think really radon is so unknown. People don't understand that there isn't a plug-in device to put in your house. It's not that simple. It's, it's a simple test to do, but we don't have these in our houses already. I think if, if I could have one message for my dad, it would be to go get the test. It costs less than going to Starbucks and getting two drinks for two people to go and get a test and put it in your basement or your lower level and, and find out if you have radon in your house. We talked about the fact that he said, it, if this is why I have lung cancer from radon, then it, I wanted to blow this you know, out of the water. I don't think he had enough time 
to be able to take the message as far as he would like to. I think it progressed so quickly that he wasn't able to do that. His biggest legacy in his death through lung cancer would be to make sure that people are getting their homes tested. I would love if the medical profession could help everybody with this. I know when I go to my pediatrician's office with my children, there's tons of signs on the door about carbon monoxide or poison control or so many different things that I need to follow up on that I've never seen anything about radon. So it's very important to me for the doctors and nurses to be able to tell us or, or give us an idea that it is something we need to look into, it is something we need to follow up on at our own homes so that we can be keeping our families safe. I would like you as medical professionals to encourage your patients to get the test. We don't know everything there is to know yet. We're still learning, but we can start with this test. It's odorless, tasteless, and colorless. There are no sensory reminders to alert us to its presence. Radon is a radioactive gas, a silent killer, which is seeping into homes and workplaces across this nation. Radon gas is a radioactive decay product of radium. Radium occurs naturally below the Earth's surface in soil, rock, and water. As radium decays, it produces radon gas, which collects in soil and groundwater. Radon, in turn, decays through alpha particle emission. Alpha particles generally do not penetrate through the dead layer of the skin, so it is not considered an external radiation exposure hazard. However, radon decays into a series of solid radioactive decay products that can remain unattached in the air or attached to existing aerosols or other airborne particles. Depending on the size of the particles, the decay products, and the attachment rate, the particles can be inhaled and deposited in the lung on the respiratory epithelium. Once inhaled, two of the radon decay products, polonium-218 and polonium-214, undergo further alpha decay and impart the greatest radiation dose to the inner lining of the lung. Because buildings are not generally built radon resistant, radon tends to concentrate indoors. Radon has been found in various concentration levels nationwide. It generally enters at the lowest level of the building and can move into other areas especially when the building is heated or cooled using forced air. All buildings can potentially have elevated concentrations of radon, even new constructions. Radon enters buildings through cracks in foundation walls and floors, as well as spaces around conduits and pipes. Even use of groundwater can contribute to indoor radon levels. The National Research Council's Committee on the Biological Effects of Ionizing Radiation at the National Academy of Science has documented the positive dose response findings of lung cancer risk based on 11 large scale studies of radon exposed underground miners. Their findings indicated that radon is a potent occupational carcinogen and concluded that new cases of lung cancer are greatly increased by radon exposure to the general population. The EPA estimates that radon is responsible for over 21,000 lung cancer deaths each year in the United States. Direct evidence from combined or pooled residential radon studies performed in North America, China, and Europe supports the EPA's mortality estimates. It is an underappreciated fact that radon exposure is the second leading cause of lung cancer and the leading cause of lung cancer in individuals who have never smoked. Most radon-induced lung cancers occur from protracted exposure to low and medium radon concentrations. In the United States, Radon is the leading environmental cause of cancer mortality and the seventh leading cause of cancer mortality overall. As physicians and healthcare providers, we should all become proactive in the fight against radon and the efforts to get the word out. We must join the front lines of this battle to reduce cancer. Our best defense against radon-related lung cancer is to raise public awareness and knowledge. Educating patients about the risks and promoting the use of radon test kits is something everyone can do and should do. As a healthcare provider, you are in a position to help spread the word that researchers have found elevated levels of radon in all 50 states and throughout Canada. It is estimated that high levels of radon can be found in as many as 1 in 15 homes across our nation. And people won't know if they have significant or actionable levels of radon where they live or work 
unless they test. Test kits are simple to use, inexpensive, and widely available. Kits can often be found in local hardware stores, county extension offices, and even ordered over the internet. There are basically two types of test kits available. Short-term kits are single use. They work by sampling the air in the environment over several days. Placed in a basement, crawl space, or other suspect areas, they trap radon particles from the air into charcoal containers. That container is then sealed and mailed to a laboratory for analysis. The cost to purchase these kits is minimal, and it often includes the cost of a certified laboratory's evaluation and delivery of the results. The second type is a long-term radon detector that is placed in the home for one year. The long-term tests are available for purchase in the same locations as short-term tests. They are designed to sample levels of radon over extended periods of time. When the lab report arrives, numbers will clearly state the levels of radon found in the sampled area. Understanding the numbers on the report is important. They will tell you if you need to take action or simply test again in a few years. Radon levels are shown as a number of picocuries per liter. Studies have shown that in the United States, our average outdoor levels are 0.4 picocuries per liter and indoor levels average about 1.3 picocuries per liter. While the EPA's current take action level is 4 picocuries per liter, they remind you that radon is a radioactive gas and suggest you may want to consider mitigating procedures with levels between 2 and 4 picocuries per liter. The World Health Organization currently recommends 3 picocuries per liter as a worldwide guideline. If test results demonstrate elevated levels of radon, we recommend taking action as quickly as possible to have a mitigation system installed. Often certified professionals only need a day in your home to seal cracks and install a radon mitigation system that lowers levels of radon by venting it safely outside. Because there are so many variables involved, it is difficult to predict the cost, but many people find the cost is similar to a basic home repair job, and professionals will provide estimates in advance of performing the work. Remember, the risk of radon-associated lung cancer is reduced as quickly as a mitigation system is in place. Act now. Test your home and educate your patients, families, and friends. You never know whose life you may be saving. I've tested my home in the past and found the radon levels were normal. I retested a couple years ago and found they had risen to six people curious per liter. I immediately contacted a certified professional and had them install a radon mitigation system. Overnight, the radon levels went from 6 picocuries per liter to 0 0.6 picocuries per liter. My family and I now breathe easier. So thank you for um, watching it. It sort of uh, shows the radon uh, dilemma that we face in the United States in a, in a really short vignette, sort of, a, sort of an abstract. Um, what I want to do is go into some of these issues in a little bit more detail, but leave time at the end if you have particular questions that, that we can ask, that you may want to ask. So here are the main topics I want to cover. Uh, radon occurrence, health risk, radon measurement, radon mitigation, and then education for providers and what you can do to reduce radon uh, for your patients. As we talked about, I was mentioned in the film, radon stocks part of the uranium-238 decay chain, decays to radium-226, uh, and then to radon, which is a gas. This gas is very mobile and, and moves into the home. Uh, you can't uh, see it, you can't smell it. Uh, it enters primarily from the soil. In Iowa, about 98% of our radon comes from the soil, not from water sources. One of the things that we, uh, we were doing some work with the World Health Organization uh, developing guidance for member countries, one of the things that, that we tried to message is that radon is naturally occurring outdoors. In fact, we have outdoor concentrations of radon that equal the national indoor average year-round outdoors. 
And if you look at, uh, it says it's naturally occurring outside. We don't consider it naturally occurring inside. Builders choose to build homes that are not radon resistant. We choose to build homes that actually suck the radon up into the home and can magnify the concentrations 10 to 100 fold in some homes. So it's naturally occurring outside, but it's enhanced inside because we decide to build houses in a way that traps radon. One of the things that you see here is if you look at Iowa, the red indicates high areas of, of radon uh, in the United States. And you can see Iowa is in a really high zone. Um, Iowa has the highest average radon concentrations in the United States. Over around the Redding Prong area, over in this area, is the highest regional radon concentrations. But ours, we have the highest average. Every county has concentrations. Over half the concentrations are above the EP's action level in Iowa. And if you look at it, we're, we're the, only, the only state in the nation that every county is above the EPA's action level. So, you know, we're at a particular hot spot right now. Where it generally ends, uh, enters from is from the basement through cracks in the foundation around pipe penetrations. And then it, it's uh, in the basement, uh, it can enter through the, the wall joist there. And very often we have our furnace in the basement. You have forced air heat. So you have your furnace down here you're pushing that air up into the upper floors. If you don't have a balanced system that brings makeup air down from the upper floors, generally, a, and this is probably 95% of the cases, if you go to, into your own house and you have a basement, you close the basement door. If you look at where the air is moving, put a, put a little tissue paper under your door, the air is rushing down to your basement to provide makeup air that then gets distributed up into the upper floors. So when you have that negative pressure compared to the top, that sucks the radon even further up through the up through the cracks. And generally, if you have forced air heat, if you have a 10 down here, you have about half that upstairs. So you only have about a 5. Uh, in some places, radon will come up. Uh, you'll get radon from uh, private well sources. Our highest well in, in Iowa is about 6,000 picocuries per liter. There's a general conversion factor that if you have 10,000 in water, it contributes to about 1 in indoor air. So the risk from water is not so much ingestion. They think there's probably a few stomach cancers caused uh, for radon ingestion. It's when it off gases and it goes into the home. As mentioned, radon decays into a series of radon decay products. And you can see here the, the half-life of some of these products. They're very short, but you have a constant source of radon in the home, radon-222, which is a gas. And then all these decay products that then on down are solid particles. And two of the decay products, as was mentioned in the video, polonium-218 and 214, they deliver the majority of the radiogenic dose to the lung. And why are they different than the other particles? Because they decay by alpha decay. So as was mentioned, alpha particles, they don't travel too far, but the path they travel produces a lot of ionization and a lot of energy gets transferred into those tissues. So it's not really the radon gas that's causing the lung cancer, it's these decay products. So if you have a home and you can remove the decay products through, say, using ultrastatic precipitators, it doesn't matter what your radon gas concentration is. If you can remove the de decay products, that's going to reduce your overall dose. Now, one thing of note, polonium-210 down here, um, when cigarettes, when tobacco is grown out in the field, these, it's produced out in the field too, polonium-210 out in the field where the tobacco is grown, gets attached to the tobacco plant. The leaves have these little trichomes on the bottom. The polonium-210 attaches to that, or the lead-210. And then the tobacco uh, is dried, and then that's put into the cigarette, and the polonium-210 is in there. So if you have someone that smokes a couple packs of cigarettes uh, per day over a long period of time, they're getting a greater radiation dose from that polonium than nuclear workers are allowed to get. They're getting over five rem per year. So. You know, if you smoke and have radon exposure, you're getting hit uh, from a, a, a lot of different sides. As we mentioned, it's the radon decay products. It's not the radon gas. And what happens when these alpha particles hit? You can, they have a high propensity to cause double-strand DNA breaks. And most times you hope that that cell may, may die and not, not go on to produce an aberrant, uh, aberrant repair that could lead to cancer. But of all the environmental carcinogens, radon is the one that causes the most double-strand DNA breaks that are hard to repair. Alpha particles will also produce uh, free radical formation. 
And these free radical formation can also damage the DNA and cause single and double strand DNA breaks. And we published a study uh, a few years ago that, that looked at GSTM1. GSTM1 produces antioxidants. About half of us in this room do not have GSTM1. And if you're GSTM1, GSTM1 null, you have about threefold increased risk of developing radon induced lung cancer because you don't have those antioxidants produced to deal with the free radical formation. It can also hit the tumor suppressor genes, and, and then if the cancer starts to develop, it won't be suppressed by the P53. How we test it uh, is a long-term test, as, as was displayed in the video. So this is an alpha track detector. The radon gas goes through the filter, and inside this little piece of plastic, and it's, it's shown here, that's, that's usually inside the detector. And then as radon decays, these alpha particles are produced, and it produces these little, little marks, little tracks on the piece of plastic. And then that plastic is taken and etched uh, in acid overnight, and then counted with a microscope at 100x, and the number of counts are proportional to the radon concentration times the time it was in the house. So that's how we measure what the radon concentration is. But it sort of gives you, you know, radon's you know, tough that you don't really see it, you can't really feel it. But if you think about, here's a piece of plastic, and these alpha particles are causing these little holes in the piece of plastic. It sort of gives you a visualization of the energy that alpha particles have. And here's what it looks like blown up a little bit. So each one of these is an alpha particle that hit the, hit the little plastic and left a little mark. One of the things that you look at when you, you look at comparative risk is this is the, the, the average radiation uh, dose for the average person in the United States. This is one from 1987. And you can see back in 1987, radon represented over 50% of the average person in the United States radiation dose. In Iowa, of course, that 55% is much higher for radon because we have such high concentrations here. And then you can see other sources of, of exposure, uh, medical x-rays, nuclear medicine. So if you look at those percents, try to remember for medical x-rays, 11% uh, nuclear medicine, how it was back in 87. Here's what we project for now. So you can see the increase in medical x-rays that the average individual is getting. So CT barely showed up back then. And you can see now we're getting a large dose from CT. We're getting a, a, a good-sized dose from uh, nuclear medicine and interventional fluoroscopy. And radon's reduced. So when this chart came out, people were emailing me, said, look, we've done such a good job. The dose is less now for the radon. I said, no, it's actually more exposure than ever. So now we're getting radiation dose from, from uh, medical procedures. We're getting it from radon more than we've ever, ever have. Uh, so it's, you know, radiation dose is cumulative. So this is, this is not a good thing. So what do we know about the science? Well, we know if you expose animals to radon, they develop, uh, they develop lung tumors, and it's a sort of a dose response function. Kind of interestingly, also some strains also develop mammary tumors. Um, but our real evidence came from studies of radon-exposed underground miners that started, studies started back in the 70s and 80s. So you go down, you make the measurement in the mines, and then you look at their adverse uh, health effects. And you can, you can see studies have been done in mines all over the world, and most of these studies are still continuing. These cohorts are still being followed over time. And here's some of the dose that, that you'll see. This is in a different cumulative measure of exposure working level months. But here's, you know, you can see these large cumulative doses, and just sort of give you a perspective. If you live in your home uh, for 25 years at 20 picocuries per liter, this is the relative dose that you would receive. So you can see the doses in the home uh, overall are much less than what the miners received. But if you look at the dose response for these studies, and each one of these is, is one of the uh, studies that were done, the uh, retrospective cohort studies that were done. So on this axis, we have a relative risk. Uh, like here we have one, so that means no, in, no increased risk, and then two is about 100% increased risk. And then as you move to the right, that's increasing cumulative exposure. So you can see the uh, dose response that we see. But as I mentioned, a lot of this dose response, it's due to uh, very high concentrations. The red mark here indicates the overlap you would see living 25 years at, uh, or, or 25 years at 20 picocuries per liter. So you can see there's some overlap 
And you can see even with a minor study in that range, you're seeing an increase in the response to that kind of exposure. And here's some other studies, uh, Sweden, uh, Beaver Lodge. You can see some have pretty good overlap. The Radium Hill study had complete overlap in, in their study uh, to what we can get in the home. So the question is, can you use these minor based studies and infer what the risk is to the average person uh, in their home? So think about differences between minors. And most of them are male, so we don't, we don't know about adverse health effects that may affect females. Uh, deposition environment's different. Uh, the dust is different. They could have diesel exposure. They could have uh, silica exposure. So there's, it kind of confounds, possibly confounds the uh, response. Think about the breathing. Instead of, instead of normal breathing, a lot of them are working hard, breathing through their mouth. So the deposition is different. So there were concerns that are these really representing? Can you really project? what the risk is from these minor based studies. But the, the National Academy of Science, when they first did their evaluation, the case control studies of people living in their homes, it was not complete at that time. So they based their original risk estimates on these minor studies. And they estimated back uh, in 99 that about 19,000 lung cancer deaths each year in the United States was due to residential radon exposure. So this was an extrapolation or rather an interpolation of the minor data based on the dose people receive in their home, but it's an extrapolation, uh, like I said, an interpolation. So that was their best estimate. Whoops. So the EPA then took that figure that the National Academy of Science report, and they updated it with demographic information. And the upgraded, updated demographic information uh, came, came up with about 21,000 people die each year. And that's what we use, we generally use now. Um, we're working with some folks at the EPA, and we're trying to do an update of the risk estimates. And while we have more people exposed to radon than we ever have before, fortunately, smoking rates have gone down. And there's a synergism between smoking and radon. So if you have less people smoking, the risk to radon is also reduced because you don't have that synergism acting. So we think the updated risk estimates, and you can see these are based on 1995 data, uh, we believe that they're probably going to be about the same because you don't have that synergism, as much synergism that's occurring from the smoking. But what we are seeing is we're seeing a lot more lung cancers in, in uh, never smokers, particularly women. As you can see, the cancer statistics, I don't know if you can see that from the back, but as far as uh, incident cases, prostate and breast are the number one incident cases in the United States. But if you look down for estimated deaths, the mortality, lung cancer is the leading cause of death for both men and women. And if you can see those numbers, the numbers for lung cancer uh, for both men and women, you can probably add up the next two or three, and it still doesn't equal how many people are dying from uh, lung cancer. So we're talking about 158,000 people each year die from lung cancer. So if you look at secondary causes, secondary causes are really important because the magnitude of the of the number of deaths in smokers and uh, lung cancer is so great. So if you look at where radon um, ranks, when you look at all the uh, different types of cancer types, if, if radon-induced lung cancer was a separate category of its, of its own, uh, it would be in there in one of the top 10 causes of cancer mortality in, in the United States. So if you Think about radon compared to smoking. There's really no comparison. It just it just masks any any consideration for radon. But if you can't, you think about any any kind of behavior or any kind of exposure. Nothing really compares to smoking. But if you look at it from this perspective, to think that here's here's some here's something out there, an exposure that's causing 21,000 deaths each year, and many of these are many of these are smokers uh, or ex-smokers. But there's still about four or five thousand that are people that have never smoked and are developing developing lung cancer uh, from radon. So it's a it's a you know very significant risk. So after there were some concerns concerns about the minor based studies, there was a decision made to uh, maybe we need to do case control studies. So in case control studies, uh, the 13 were done in Europe. We had about seven done in North America. We performed a case control study in Iowa. And, and, and when you perform these studies, it's, it's a population-based study. So you look for incident, incident, can, uh, incident cases of lung cancer. Um, you have to get out there right away and do an interview. So we identify them through the cancer registry. We added an extra component 
when we did the study of rapid reporting, because what happens if you think about it, if you see a new cancer, you see it, uh, you go to a hospital or go to the path labs and you see that someone has a histology for lung cancer, and if you don't get out there right away, you're not going to have interviews with people, um, most of the people, you have six months or, so, or 50% one year survival. And who are going to be the first people that pass away? The people with small cell lung cancer. So if you don't get out there right away, you're going to have sort of a biased sample of people that you interview about their potential exposure. So we have, uh, you know, I, I really urge you to go and look at the study design that we used for Iowa. It was, it was very unique. Iowa was the only study where we didn't just measure radon concentration. People had lived in their current homes for 20 years. You can only do studies like that in a place like Iowa. We had 50% of the people we contacted that had lived in their current homes for 20 years. The median was 32 years. The other studies tried to go back to six, up to six homes in the past where people had lived. Um, the other thing we did was unique in Iowa is the other studies looked at concentrations of radon in the home. What we did was we did a retrospective mobility assessment of where people spend time. So we would say, tell us in 2004 how much time you spent in your house. We would figure out what their life events were throughout their time period living in that house over the past 30 years. So we would, we would get anchors, like when they had children, when, when the, the folks were working. And in Iowa, we just did a women's study. We thought they spent more time in a home and less occupational lung carcinogens. So that's why we picked women. But instead of saying, say, in 1995, we would say between the time your first and second child was born, these were, was at a stable period. We, we set that up front. And then we give them anchors to report where they spend time. Uh, we seasonally adjusted that. And we have a lot of publications validating the methodology we use. Because in the Iowa study, one of the women that had the highest radon exposure or radon dose concentrations in her home actually had the lowest exposure because she was a woman truck driver and hardly spent any time in her home. So if you would do a study, you would assume that she's had high exposure when, in fact, she didn't. She was outside a lot and only had a lower exposure because when she was in her home, it was high, but her cumulative exposure wasn't that great. And here's uh, uh, the Iowa study, the primary paper uh, published in uh, 2000 uh, describing the study. So if, if you have an opportunity, I'll show you a site later that has all these studies that I'm talking about in PDF format. You can go and, and look at these studies. And here's all the case control studies all together. And this, this vertical line represents an odds ratio of, of uh, one, which would be no increased risk. And you can see the central estimate for all the case control studies, except for one or two, showed a positive effect at uh, four picocuries per liter. So you can see some of the studies, um, like the Iowa study, showed over a 50% increase in lung cancer risk at the EPA action level. So what we decided to do was we decided that it would be good to pool the studies. And you probably have heard of meta-analysis. Meta-analysis is where you take the summary findings from, from different studies. But with a pooled analysis, you take all the original data and you redo the analysis. So we did a pooled study of the uh, North American study and a pooled study of the European uh, studies. And for the North American studies, we found a 10 to 18% increased lung cancer risk at three picocuries per liter. Remember, that's below the EPA's action level. And for the European studies, we found a 60% increased risk. And we've been working on pooling these studies for the past uh, seven or eight years, so we have a global pooling of radon studies. But we think these are underestimates of the actual risk, because when you do these epidemiology studies, when you have exposure misclassification, so you're misclassifying dose that people have had, what that tends to do is it minimize any effect toward the null. So, we found in the Iowa study that when we accounted for where people spend time, that increased the, the uh, risk estimate substantially. None of these studies accounted for where people spend time. So we think these are probably underestimates of the true exposure that, that, uh, or the true risk that, that we think is actually occurring. So from these studies, um, after these studies were, were found, uh, were reported, the World Health Organization uh, thought that based on the findings of the pooled radon studies that there should be an international project uh, to inform member countries of the risk based on radon. So we developed a guidance for uh, the 
health leaders in different countries to uh, to come up with some sort of um, directions or cookbooks for uh, trying to make trying to take efforts to reduce the uh, radon concentrations in their country. And what we didn't what we, what, it said on the video that the World Health Organization it's their guidelines it's three it's actually two point seven, but it's not like an action level like we have in the United States. It's a guidance, and we say at two point seven. Here's the risk. Here's the risk you see. Then it's up to the member countries to say, how do the other risk so we have in this country compare to that so that they can prioritize where they should take action. So, but they thought, the World Health Organization thought because of the consistency and the findings that there really need to be an initiative to reduce indoor radon risk. And that's, that's been completed. That's available um, at the web website or just uh, type in WHO and then uh, we publish this report, which det details all the studies that have been performed uh, in the globally. So one thing I want to point out, and I've kind of been alluding to it, or actually stating it, is that the EPA's action level is four picocuries per liter. Um, it is not a health-based guideline. The guidance, WHO guidance, is 2.7. The average values we see in U.S. homes are 1.3. Um, in Iowa. 70% of our homes are above four, so we don't, we're way above this. And I mentioned before that we have areas in Iowa that outdoor year-round are about 1.2 from the off-gassing from the, from the soils. So if we look uh, down here, that's 0.4 for outdoor in the United States. So if we were actually doing a, a risk guidance that the EPA uses for all the chemicals that they, that they regulate, say one in chance of having a cancer, one in 10,000, one in 100,000, we'd have to have it below, if it was actually a regulation based on the current thinking for the EPA, we'd have to reduce outdoor radon concentrations. <laughs> if you think about that, if it was truly health-based, as EPA regulates chemicals, it'd be 0.4. And here's the EPA risk guide. So you can see the estimated risk at the EPA action level uh, over over 40 or 50 years living at that, that level, is the chance is about 6 in 100 for smokers and about 7 in 1,000 for never smokers. I mean, I, went, I would bet on those odds, you know, versus the lottery. I mean, that's, that's a high risk, and that's what, that's what we're dealing with. And, and it's even more of a risk here in Iowa. So just summary from, the, from this perspective is radon is a global public health concern. Uh, residential radio sites provide direct evidence, so we don't have to extrapolate from minor data right now. And radon is, this is something I started saying a few years ago when EPAs adopted and other people have started to use it. Radon is our leading environmental cause of cancer mortality. So what's our leading environmental cause of cancer? What's our leading environmental cause of cancer? Smoking. I'm not talking about. I'm talking about environmental. Not not a personal habit. It's sunlight, right? Yeah. It's just that the you, you have a high incidence, but the mortality is generally not that great uh, for base one squamous. So, radons are leading environmental cause of cancer mortality in the United States and ninth leading cause of cancer mortality overall. So let me just talk. Go switch directions a bit. Talk about radon testing and mitigation. So EPA came up with a, uh, the guidance back in the 80s and 90s that the test for radon, a lot of the, real, a lot of the radon testing is performed during real estate transactions. People want to buy a house, but they have to do, have a radon test. So they had to come up with a short measure of what your exposure could be from buying a house or living in a house. So they came up with this method to, to try to, every way they can, bias the results you get from that short-term test to the highest level that they could get that house to express in a short period of time. So what do you do? You close up your house for 24 hours, 48 hours before you test. So then the radon's building up. And the thought is, is if you do a short-term test, when everything's closed up, then in most cases, the year-long concentration will be below that value. And studies in Iowa, what we found is that you have to get, if your short-term test is, is three, it has to get down to below 2.7 to have a 95% confidence that your year-long concentration is going to be below 4. But this, was their, this is what they came up with, and, and I was always critical of, of the short-term method. 
And then when we did that WHO uh, work, I, I chaired the measurement committee, so we had to come up with guidance for member countries. And that's funny, when, when the shoe's on your foot, it's like, what are you going to do now? What, what are you suggesting? But globally, there's not as many real estate transactions, so we sort of moved more to a long-term test. The best thing is to do a short-term test and then follow it up with a long-term test just to make sure. So the detector is placed in the breathing zone, uh, not down on the floor. Uh, radon's a little bit heavier than air, but you don't see any pooling. Just a little bit of circulation uh, causes the radon to circulate well within a room. Uh, the general thinking is from EPA is you do two simultaneous tests in a room. If the concentrations are above four, they recommend mitigation. If it's below four, no mitigation is recommended. But if you're really concerned about your health and not just real estate, I would really recommend a long-term long test. The good thing is radon can be reduced. And this is a sort of a little graphic of a home. And this is the concrete foundation. And we know that radon goes up through cracks. But what they do when they do a mitigation is someone will come in and generally they'll, they'll drill a hole in that side of your pad in the basement. They'll drill a hole in the other side of your pad in the basement. They'll put like a vacuum, a vacuum over this one side into the home so it's sucking down into that hole and trying to pull air from underneath your slab. And then they go over to the other side and they generate smoke to see if the smoke then is pulled down through that hole and taken up on the other side. If it is, then you can usually get away with one suction point. But sometimes on your pad, you have a footer here and you may be sucking here, but it's not getting the, not getting the radon out from that side. So you may have to put two suction points. So you, you, you drip, if, so if you have, if you're okay with one, then what you do is you, you drill a hole, four inch hole, and then you have to sort of clean that out underneath where you drilled. You sort of just, you, you grab the, you grab the materials uh, with uh, some sort of little shovel. And they always say it's engineered, this hole's engineered to be the length of the arm. That's what mitigators say. <laughs> it's engineered with how long their arms are. So then you fill that in with some good size uh, gravel. And then you put this PVC pipe in, this four inch P P PVC pipe. And with existing homes, the hard part is trying to figure out how to get this up through the home for existing homes. I mean, you don't want to go through your, you don't want to go through your living room but sometimes you can find some way to get it out. You want to put the fan up top because you don't want the fan down here. If you have a crack up here or something happens, then you're pushing the radon into the house. So usually the fan goes on the very top out here, and then the code says that the pipe has to go through the roof. Uh, when they first came out with these systems, they would come up here and go here, and then you'd open your window and it would go back in, in through your window. So they thought that's not good. So the so new code is, is you have to put it up through the rooftop. And sometimes people have crawl spaces. With crawl spaces, you kind of have to cover that with plastic and then put a suction under the crawl space. So that there's definitely ways to deal with it. And no matter what the radon concentration is, 95% of the time, it can be reduced by these little systems. Here's, what it, here's some of the penetrations that come up where the radon can come up. But that's what the PVC tube looks like in the basement. Sometimes if you're lucky, you have an attached garage, you can come up and then run it up through the garage and out through the roof. And that's what it looks like up in the upper floors with the fan. Now, there are, um, there are places like Iowa City, uh, Coralville, where I'm from, and some other area, a good number of areas around the country where cities have said any homes built need a radon-resistant new construction type uh, um, engineering when the house is built. So when they build the house, they put the pipes underneath and they put the, this plastic up through. But what they don't do what they don't do is they don't put the fan in. So when then someone moves in, it will have a it will have a plastic up through, and then the, then the owners can test. And if it's above four or above three, whatever your comfort level is, uh, then you can go up and put the fan in. So generally, to put a system in um, in an existing house can run, run anywhere from twelve hundred to three or four thousand. And right now, it is something that's covered under healthcare spending accounts. So you can put a system in and charge that to the healthcare spending account, as well as any lead paint remediation. So those are uh, some good benefits. And that's what it looks like up, up on the roof. 
And for new homes, as I was saying, you put the systems in as the home's built, and you don't put the fan in, you put the fan in uh, at a later time. So I just want to talk about uh, providers, providers here a little bit. There's a lot of, there's a lot of different uh, stakeholders that are involved with educating the public, but I don't think there's any that have the impact that medical providers do. For a lot of the patients, a lot of, a lot of people you see in clinic, you're the only scientist that, that they see. You're the person with the credibility that they'll listen to in most cases. <laughs> and, you know, our goal has really been trying to work with medical providers, providers lately. The EPA had a, a physician's guide that was published in 1993, and right now um, I wrote a new, new healthcare providers guide. I'm working with them to get it out to, uh, out to healthcare providers, and uh, we're really trying to update it. Here's, here's what the cover looks like, and we hope to have this out in June. A lot of focus groups from a lot of healthcare providers went into um, developing this uh, new guidance. So it's been pretty well tested. One of the things that we found, let me just go back, one of the things we found in focus groups was that healthcare providers, they, they thought that lung cancer among never smokers is rare. And if you, if you really look at the data, here are the estimated U.S. deaths in 2006, it's estimated that there's about 20,000 people that have never smoked and get lung cancer. You think about that, that's huge. I mean, so if you, if you have uh, lung cancer never smokers, that's one of the top 10 causes of, of cancer death. So there's a big, there's a large group out there, um, and like, as I mentioned, it seems to be increasing in women of people that have never smoked that are, that are uh, getting lung cancer. And there's been a good number of papers out. This is not my area of expertise, but it seems like the genetics of people that don't smoke and get lung cancer is a little bit different than the people who do. So there's a lot of work done in that area. So trying to reduce a radon in, in that group is people have never smoked. It's really important. Um, I found out from focus groups that there's been limited training, so that's why I'm really excited to be here today and, and present this information. And I'm presenting a lot of information I know, but if you have a chance to grab a, a, grab a handout uh, of the slides, I, I think that'd be great that you can look at some of the stuff I may not be able to cover. Um, we're also trying to get uh, information out in the literature for healthcare providers. Uh, so I've been working with colleagues writing articles. This was published in Clinical Chest Medicine, Occupational Environmental Causes of Lung Cancer, and previously radon was not really highlighted in these kind of publications. Uh, the New Parks Occupational Lung Disorders, I had a colleague, we have a chapter on there, with occupational lung disorders, we really hit the uh, radon pretty hard uh, in that chapter. So that 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 uh, book just came out. There's a chapter on, on occupational lung carcinogens. But the video that I showed, there's a longer video that's a 20 22 minute video as well that goes into a bit more detail. That's at the Breathing Easier uh, info link uh, through the Iowa Cancer Consortium. And on this link, we have a lot of information for healthcare providers. There's posters that you can take in print. We're going to have the new healthcare providers guide at that link. Uh, so we're, we're really excited about that. But there's a lot of information at uh, that link. So I'd really urge you to look at that. Th in the video that you saw, it's also on the EPA's main Reddit, Radon webpage. So if you go to the Radon webpage, you can get a link to that video as well. But there's the, there's the EPA's webpage. Uh, we found that physicians and healthcare providers have a lot of existing uh, uh, relationships with other coalitions, so we've been trying to work with them. And the good thing about uh, working with them is that then they have their own group of stakeholders that we can, uh, that we can get involved with. There are some of our stakeholders. The other thing that's relatively new and we're trying to make some inroads on is you probably know that there's uh, new guidelines for low-dose CT screening for lung cancer. And a lot of times people call and they're not eligible. They don't meet the, they don't meet the criteria uh, from the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force for having enough pack years, or they may have quit more than 15 years ago. They're not eligible for that. But if you can t give them information on smoking cessation or give them information on radon, it's a really uh, teachable moment we found. So we're trying to get radon information into low-dose CT screening centers. Um, so they recommend uh, screening for people that meet these criteria. I think this is the one that's approved, uh, approved by the, the government to, you know, to fund and give compensation for. But the National Comprehensive Cancer Network also has another guideline uh, 
that has less uh, pack years and uh, younger age if you've had high radon exposure. So that's another criteria that's out there too that considers radon when you're making the decision whether or not someone's eligible for low-dose CT screening. So this is the guide that's coming out, uh, the different sections that we have, and I hope that's going to be out in, in June. And just some, you know, included there are some interventions that, that you can do, um, ask your patients. I mean, the, the big thing is getting, getting that question on, on your electronic medical records or your queries when uh, folks come into the clinic, have you tested your radon? I mean, right under, you know, smoking, smoking information. I mean, that step alone would really enhance our communication with patients. But that's one that we, we really are trying to get, uh, trying to get physicians and healthcare providers to include. So ask them if they, they test it and about their risk. Um, it's, this presentation, I, I'm giving you a lot of information, but I'm hoping that this is just the beginning of a relationship for some of us if you need things. I, I go out of, out of my way, my wife says. I, I don't think so. <laughs> but she says, you're, yeah, you're working on ice. I'm answering questions. But to me, this is, you know, when we've performed that Iowa study, and you go and you meet these women in Iowa, and you know that when you come back in a year to pick up the detectors, half of them are not going to be there. It makes an impression on you. So this has become a passion for me. So, you know, some people do crossword, pro, crossword puzzles and other things. I like to talk to people that are working on radon issues in the evening. Or, or during my day. So if you ever have any questions, please, please email me. If I can help you provide information, you know, please, please feel free to contact me. But if one thing you can do, if you can just include this on there, and uh, you know, there's numbers, uh, they can call 1-800-383-5992 to get a detector. There's detectors available through local health departments. Uh, but this is, you know, it's the biggest thing uh, that you could, you could do. And then if you have a chance to go back and watch the longer video, uh, what we're hoping to have done by fall is to have CMEs uh, for people that they can, they can go take the online um, training, uh, look over the, the healthcare provider's guide, answer some questions, and get CME online credits for that. So we're working uh, on that for the summer. So with that, here's my email, and I'll be glad to take questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, for new construction areas, uh, if you've got uh, 10 acres and houses are going to go up, are all the houses really are about the same risk of radon, or is it just completely hit and miss? Yeah, that, and that's that's a good question. The question was if you have a big area and all the houses going on, if if some seem to be okay, are they all okay, or or at least? And my simple answer is no. You can't tell. It depends on the construction of the house. The source is the most important. Um, there's, there's a big site down in Florida that, that was built on phosphogypsum. So we know that's a problem. All the homes, there's a big lawsuit now, and they all have to be torn down, and, and the people compensate it. So unless there's a case like that, you really don't know. You really have to test. Because you can be in a low radon area, but your home can be 40 or 50. So we... It, you just never know what that local source is. So the best thing to do, especially in Iowa, because we know there are no low areas in Iowa with 70% above above four. So. So for uh, new construction, uh, you can't test while the building's going up. You have to wait till it's all completed, all sealed up, then test. Right. So we've tried that. So what we've tried is do uh, the soil re radon release from soil. So we go in and we put little detectors in these little containers. It has really poor predictive value. I mean, it depends how much suction you have. Do you have a gen air in your house? Are you, are you creating a suction that's pulling more up? Uh, yeah, I really recommend getting the system put in, but, but then check it and get the fan put in if you need it. Yes. What about um, buildings that, where people work, like hospitals and clinics and uh, stores and they're yeah. there all day long. Are those being tested at all? No. Uh, and that's, that's one of the things we have at the university is if people are concerned just at the university where we are, if they have a concern, the health protection people will test. But we performed a study that we published two years ago in Missouri, and we looked at the radon concentrations for the workers at health departments and then looked at their exposures at the health departments. They were not statistically different. And this is not on the basement. This is on the first floor. So occupational exposure 
I mean, that's a big source of, of radiation exposure that's not, not really being addressed. OSHA uh, guidelines right now are so high that they're, they're ludicrous. The only time you find something that may, someone's working in a cave, you know, some sort of cave, tourist cave, but generally the concentrations aren't high enough for OSHA to kick in. A lot of states are using the four pica curies per liter as a default. So it depends on the employer. Yeah, but yeah, it's a, it's a problem. But we're, that's what we're working on with WHO now is trying to develop guides for member countries for occupational exposure. But more needs to be done. There's a lot of studies out there, and and the pro the problem with with some of the work that's been done, the only one we're sure of is lung cancer. There's some um, there's some consideration of leukemias, including chronic lymph lymphocytic leukemia. Uh, the study that you're talking about, there's just a study out with. Uh, uh, it's not published there. <laughs> there's, but there's some other there's other studies. Probably the biggest study was a study that was a American Cancer Society cohort study that was done, and they estimated what the radon concentration was by geography. And in that study, they they knew the outcomes, and what they found was there seems to be a progression of COPD with high radon, and we're trying to get uh, radon included. We're doing a COPD gene study now at the university. We're trying to get that included. But the problem with most of the studies are you know, I talked about trying to match where people spend time. Most of the studies that you see are performed is they have the outcome information or it's county level. So they say in this county it's elevated for, say, skin cancer or something. And then they'll do the county average radon concentration. They're called ecologic or aggregate studies. And they're really good for hypothesis generation, but they're terrible. You can't assess risk. But yet the layman can't tell the difference between the two, two studies and they weight them evenly. So there's a lot of misinformation out there. Yeah, just, okay. All the time. Yep. Yeah. And realtors, I, I know we have some folks here that that know know some realtors. What they kind of do is a lot of times they'll put they'll put money is where they buy a house on so contingency, or they'll buy a house and they'll they'll put money in escrow. So they'll put like 2000 in escrow, and then they do the test, and if it's high, then that money from escrow could be used to pay for it. But that's, that's pretty common. But realtors, it's, some realtors are great. Other realtors are, you know, they don't want to know it. It messes up the real estate transaction. Question? Sunshine or light No, no. So, so that has the only synerg well we think it has it has synergism with with other kind of lung carcinogens we think it's a submultiplicative effect but sunlight doesn't doesn't have an effect there's some studies being done now that was always assumed with skin cancers that remember these are decay products and they're alpha particles and the alpha particles usually can't get through the dead layer of the skin there's some studies showing that if people are really sun damaged or skin sun damaged or their thin is, their skin is really thin older folks that the alpha particles may get through and contribute to basal cell, but that's just all, all hypotheses now. But th that's what you asked. You asked about sunlight? Is that right? So how is, for example, the No, it doesn't. No. No. It's just, I said it's another environmental carcinogen. It's just, you know, the sunlight will cause the it will lead to the skin cancer. And that's hard to track because the cancer registry, we track melanoma, but we don't track basal or squamous cell. They say there's what, what, more squamous and basal cell than, than there are people over the age of 60 <laughs> in, in the different states. But that's, I mean, that's the biggest, that's the biggest one. But, mm -hmm. Okay, so if... Please stay in touch with me, okay? If if you have a question, or if I can help, or if you need, if you're giving a presentation, or talking to groups, or or you know, um, my my slides are your slides. Any any resource I have is your resource because the goal is to uh, reduce reduce this risk. So I really I really thank you for coming. <laughs>